Endless Hustle is presented by Eat Clean Bro, a convenient solution to bring you the highest quality chef-prepared meals delivered right to your door. Eat Clean Bro is the contract-free solution for your meal prep needs. Made with all natural ingredients and next day delivery, every meal feels like you have someone cooking for you right at home. All right, I got a great day on the Endless Hustle as I'm joined by two very funny men and can't believe it, the show's still on the air. No, of course, I'm kidding. Congrats to ComFD is back, Steve Lemmy, Kevin Heffernan. We were just recounting old memories. We're old friends when I had you guys at the NHL and Gabe was totally fanboying at the NHL. I felt like such a big shot. He's, you know, yeah. he's a tough dude. And we always, you know, we always give him crap about, you know, the mo- the day that he got onto that NHL thing and was allowed to say his message out to the Leafs and he blew it. He totally blew it. Yeah, he, he you know, he's a muscular guy. He rides a motorcycle. He's got tattoos. He brags about how tall and handsome and tough he is, the whole thing. And uh, you said, hey, let's record something for uh, for the Maple Leafs in the playoffs. It'll go up on the Jumbotron. And he became a mush-mouthed, mush-mouthed pussy. Like, he couldn't get it out. By the way, you guys think you have enough Tacoma FD posters in your shots? Like, are we? is there enough promotion for the show here? This is what we they, they send us, like, a stack of them, you know? And then they get mad at you if you don't put them up. Because we do all like a lot of the Zoom, you know, stuff. So screw it, throw them up, man. Right? Kev, oh. show them the box. Do you have the box handy? I don't have it. It's in the. My kids took it. My kids have it. So. Okay. We have, uh, and then they send us swag. Like they sent us a, a disaster uh, preparedness kit. But the box is also this thing. Like they they spent a million dollars on this box that we're all going to throw in the garbage in a moment. You're like, hey, can we renegotiate our contracts and you'll send us that money instead of the boxes? Yeah, exactly. So congratulations, guys. Tacoma FD is back. This show has become insanely popular. It's got to be fun to be doing this thing, continue doing it, right? Great. It's it's great. I mean, we were surprised, too, that we've gotten to season three. You know, uh, when we started, we weren't sure how far we'd go. And the fact of the matter is, it's been great. And firefighters love the show. And we have endless material. We're getting all these stories from firefighters. So we feel like we could go on for like 10 seasons. Not if they keep spending money on the boxes. I know. That's it. That's it. It's like you have to spend money to make money. But guys, like, cool it, you know? So, Steve, tell me, let's get the plugs out of the way. What's happening in the new season? What are the storylines? Get it all out. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, this season we really focused on some of the in-station uh, shenanigans uh, it would be dishonest to me to say that it wasn't, you know, kind of uh, related to the the pandemic. You know, we were we were forced to not go on location and not have lots of extras, and so we dove into our creative playbook. And uh, it's really about the relationships of the characters. And uh, I I actually think this is our most eclectic uh, batch of episodes yet. Like, uh, you know, we we battle everything from the simian flu to uh, we have a chili cook-off, we, uh, we battle, uh, we get taken over by the robots in a, an ode to 2001 Space Odyssey. We do Thanksgiving, we have a fire, we have uh, sexual bias training, we, uh, we do a little Thomas Crown Affair, uh, Ocean's Eleven type thing. Um, Kev, what am I missing here? I don't know, you, you hit it all, man. Pickleball tournament, you got a pickleball tournament? Oh, uh, a big pickleball tournament. We have... Uh, we have uh, Whitney Cummings on the show this season. We have uh, former UFC heavyweight champion, the greatest of all time, Stipe Miocic, who's also a firefighter in real life. He is a guest star. He's He is to Tacoma FD what uh, Joe Namath was to the Brady Bunch. He comes on and he plays himself and he kicks our asses. Yeah, Stipe, Stipe is a tough dude. He's a great guy too. Super. Just a sweet guy. Super nice guy. It's amazing that. I guess you kind of forget that he could, he could kill you easily, but then he holds up his fist and his fist is bigger than your head, you know? Like, oh, I God. always wonder when you're like that tough and you're essentially like a ninja, how do you not just kill people in real life, like beat the shit out of people on the street? Like that's your talent. It's like being a comedian. You get on stage and you just obviously do what you do. But if you're an MMA destroyer, how do you just hold back in normal life? Well, also, the, the other thing is about it is he really is a firefighter. So, like, he has sent us pictures of him as a probe, as a rookie, being hazed by the other firefighters, like washing toilets and stuff like that. You're like, how do you, you could kick the shit out of all those guys? What does it matter? You know, if you enable screen sharing, I can show you a photo of him in his belt cleaning a toilet at the at the firehouse. 
Uh, the funny, here's the funny thing about what you were saying about, about Stipe, and it has to do with Gabe. Uh, before Stipe came on, our, uh, you know, one of our producers was like, should we get a stunt double for the, for the fight scene? Because, you know, sometimes professional fighters get excited and they forget that it's play. And I was like, no, 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 come on. Everybody's a pro. It's simple stuff. He's just smacking a few guys around, you know, open handed. And the first take uh, with Stipe and Gabe, Stipe uh, hit him for real uh, by accident and Gabe went down. And uh, we were filming it through it. Like the first shot was a far away shot through a glass door. And so Kevin and I were on the other side of the glass door and Stipe hit Gabe, Gabe went down and Stipe screamed to us. He's like, I hit him. I'm really sorry, I hit him. And we were like, ha And we all start laughing. He's like, I'm serious, your guy's down. I hit your guy. And we're laughing. And also we see crew from out there start gathering around and we're like, oh my God. And we go running. And sure enough, he had accidentally hit Gabe in the nose and Gabe was down, but it was the tip of his middle finger that hit the tip of Gabe's nose. And that was enough to knock Gabe to the floor. It's like the big kid on the playground when you're, we're all kids who doesn't realize his own strength. Yeah. And he's just beating the shit out of all the normal kids. Yeah. That was literally Stipe with Gabe. Yeah. yeah. And Gabe is 6'4". <laughs> and Stipe just smacked him around. You got to put him on the payroll as your bodyguard. Oh my God. I, I mean, he's, he's a super tough dude. You're like, what kind of a person is the heavyweight champion of UFC? And, and you meet Stipe and he's not like jacked or anything like that, but he's got these big long arms and these giant fists and, and like a, a, a massive jaw. So I wanted to talk to you guys about, we lost one of the greats this week, Norm McDonald. You guys are obviously comedy legends in your own right, but I literally fell down a wormhole on Yom Kippur of, Nor of Norm videos, forgetting how funny that dude is from his Conan appearances to SNL. I mean, the dude came back after like 18 months from getting fired from SNL, then hosted it, then made fun of NBC brass while doing it. Like that's legendary shit. What did someone like Norm mean to you guys? And did you actually know him? Did you get to meet him? I'd never met him before, but I mean, like when he took over that weekend update desk, he was so funny. He brought such a unique, you know, kind of angle to it that it was just, it was just so good. And, you know, to go back to what you're saying, it's like the funny thing was Lemmy and I we were on Kimmel the other night and it, on the day that he died and they started putting up all these clips of him and he's the greatest talk show host. I mean, talk show guest, you know? And there's just endless clips of how funny we are. And it just made me feel completely inadequate <laughs> <laughs> going on Jimmy Kimmel and being like, holy shit, look at all the stuff that Norm MacDonald did on these shows. It's so funny. It is true. It's like the, uh, I did what you did, Arthur, the, uh, the, the, the rabbit hole of, uh, of, of Norm MacDonald. And, you know, like I sent one to these guys. It was just killing me. It was that uh, the better than Ezra clip where he's on the news and he said, you know, better than Ezra uh, had is number one in the nation and uh, number two right now is Ezra, and uh, you know <laughs> he's got this like twinkle in his eye. He always had this thing that that no one else had, which was this wise ass energy. You know, he's laughing with you, but he is also laughing at you, and uh, and you know, God, a, a legendary dude, and I almost think one of the more underrated people because like. We love him and he's awesome and yet he's not talked about enough or he wasn't talked about enough. Well, he never ascended, you know, like Chappelle ended up getting Chappelle's show and then even though he was already kind of a big deal, he ascends into the A-list. Seinfeld becomes Seinfeld after Seinfeld, right? Like these, when you're a legendary comic, it's always feels like there's that one project that thrusts you into iconic stratosphere. Norm was always there but he never got that one project where you were just like, okay, he Seinfeld. Yeah. yeah. But it is interesting though, because in, in his death, it's kind of, you see how iconic he is, yep. you know, it's kind of, it's kind of a different angle. I'm, I'm sure he, maybe he would have want, wanted that Seinfeld moment, but he's, he's so appreciated and iconic and beloved and all that outpouring is happening now, which is interesting. Yeah. The other person I wanted to talk to you guys about, well, it's actually not a person. It's a franchise is super troopers. We're seeing, Obviously, the Jackass boys are back now. They're rebooting everything under the sun. Is there a Super Troopers movie happening? Like, what? What? what, what? Tell me everything. Yeah, you know, we had uh, Super Troopers two. I think was uh, was an amazing success, 
and uh, from the crowdfunding campaign to the release uh, in the theaters. And I think the studio felt that way too. And, and so we have signed on to do Super Troopers 3. Um, you know, we're a few drafts in to Super Troopers 3. Uh, you know, I, I think we're still a little bit away from, from filming it. And uh, in fact, with Broken Lizard, we're talking about trying to squeeze something in uh, before that as well. And, uh, you know, but Super Troopers, uh, you, you know, is we have a plot for Super Troopers 3 that's different from the first two, which is good because the first two basically have the same plot. And uh, I just wrote down a, an idea for season four or for, for geez, for uh, Super Troopers 4. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll pitch it to the guys. Who knows? They'll definitely. We're in a nursing home. We're in a nursing home for that one. <laughs> How did you know? How did you know? I love I love how Steve's already green lighting in his head the sequel to the next sequel. Like he's already like I already got the fourth of the bag. He's a big thinker. Well, you know, I, I will say the one thing that's great about writing a TV show, uh, and you know, Kevin and I both have this thing where it's like you're so in tune with picking up new ideas because everything you're whether you're shooting, you're working with the actors, or we're talking to real firefighters, we're telling us stories that you just hear these things and you have to train yourself to write everything down. Cause you know, it's like, uh, we were talking to somebody today who bought a, a, an eighties fire engine for a couple thousand bucks. And we were laughing about how he should fill it up with booze instead of water and have a party that way. And I was like, well, there's an idea for something, you know? And like, that's the thing. So it's like, when, whenever we have ideas for anything now, cause we're so, we're so trained that we write it down. And, uh, and it can become something as we've discovered. Is that how you see the world? Like Kevin, is that for you too? Like, I remember hearing Jerry Seinfeld talk about this because when you watch Seinfeld, it's literally the most brilliant thing ever. Like he's like, hmm, let me take a, a, a bathroom being out of toilet paper and I can turn it into a whole episode. And it's like, Jerry, what do you mean you have no toilet paper? And it's like, how genius to take something so minuscule and turn it into a half hour. Is that how you guys see the world from a writing process? Yeah, and I don't think we did so much before this television show, but you realize that you can you have that ability, you know? So And so we've done that with episodes, you know? It's like, I got my wisdom teeth taken out. That became an episode. The chief gets his wisdom teeth taken out. I don't, uh, I don't like to wear cologne, right? Boom, that became, I don't like to moisturize. You know, any little thing that, that happens, you kind of throw it into the table of the writer's room, and you spin it around and come up with a funny way to present it to the world. So it's like, you are writing those things that you know, or you're writing those things that are funny from your real life and trying to spin them into episodes, which it's a, it's a blast to do it that way, you know? What's the thing you guys pitched, Steve, that True TV was just like, this is, no, like too far, like we can't do this. Uh, nothing so far. Uh, I know what it is, I know what it is. Uh, emotional content. They. <laughs> When we, when we filmed the pilot, when we wrote the pilot script for Tacoma FD, the, the directive they gave us was no emotion, just jokes. And we had a scene between Kevin and his daughter, you know, the, the pilot episode at that moment in time was uh, his daughter is the first female firefighter at the station and she's arriving and they butt heads a little bit and then she's gonna leave the station and he thinks it's a good idea, but then they come back together and they have a little father daughter moment where he's like, you did a good job, I'm sorry. And she's like, no, dad, you know, and that was about half a page. And this, this network was like, no, get rid of it. And we whittled it down to like uh, four lines. And they were like, no, we said no emotion. And we whittled it down to a couplet. Good job. Thanks, dad. And they were like, no, no, we don't want that. And then we did wind up putting it in the pilot anyway. And then all the reviewers lashed onto that. They were like, and there's even some emotional content. But, uh, you know, so that was something that was a big no-no for, uh, for True TV three years ago. No, no. Yeah. The other thing is they don't like us to make fun of their other shows. Like they don't like us to reference them. Like we're buddies with the Impractical Joker guys. And um, we've oftentimes wanted to have some, take some joking shots at them in our, in our episodes. And whenever we do, they say, nope, nope, nope. So you're, you're not allowed to reference their other shows. Yeah. And like, we would say like, you know, look, the, the firefighters like to binge watch things. We would actually write like, hey, what do you think's on HBO Max? And they would say, nope, nope, don't do that either. And we're like, so you want us to write Netflix or Hulu? And they're like, yeah. And we're like, okay, Netflix and chill or whatever the fuck the other thing, other streaming service they, they don't mind us putting in. I love it. I love how you try to put emotion in there and they're kind of like, who do you fucking think you are, Tarantino? Like, get this yeah. shit out of here. <laughs> yeah, no way. Joke, 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 joke. 
<laughs> but but emotion is what gets you the Emmy awards. Like Ted Lasso, <laughs> I've watched Ted Lasso a couple of episodes. I'm not putting anything down. I really enjoyed it. But I was like, oh, there's tons of emotional content in this. And that's why it's getting the Emmy. Yeah, heartwarming gets you an Emmy. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, it also got Jason Sudeikis a million an episode next season. Woo! Son of a bitch. How do we Think about that? that, that the Friends cast had to wait till the end to negotiate a million an episode. And now wow. Sudeikis is getting it in three three seasons. Pretty, sol pretty that's, solid maneuver there. That's, some, that's that Apple money. That's what that is. <laughs> what, what would you guys do with a million a season? If you were getting a million a season, like conceptualize that, what is your life? An like? episode, right? An episode. An yeah. episode. Oh, yeah. yeah. A million yeah. an episode a season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. That would be, uh, that would be, it. that's different. That's a whole different animal. <laughs> yeah. A million an episode. Uh, well, I wouldn't get paid in crypto. That's for sure. Actually, no, I would get paid in crypto. That shit's going to take off. Uh, I don't know, man. Is Vegas getting paid in crypto? Sure. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> An Apple stock. I'm taking that. I'm taking that paycheck straight cash. I'm not fucking sure. around with a million, a, a million an episode. I'm like straight cash, homies, as Randy yeah, Moss said. I'm in. Episode. Yeah, briefcase, a briefcase full of hundos. We gotta talk to somebody. Jesus. Yeah, it's time. <laughs> time after this interview, True TV is gonna be like, oh my god, no way, no, no renegotiations. <laughs> yeah, what we should do, what we need to do is look at his numbers and then prorate it. <laughs> <laughs> by ratings, by yeah, viewers. Exactly. Yeah. What, what if it actually takes your current per episode salary down? <laughs> I'm going to do it privately. Impossible. If we're on True TV. Yeah. yeah. I actually want to well, ask our, you guys. Our ratings are good. We, have, we get more viewers than Curb Your Enthusiasm. Really? Yeah. You heard it here. Yeah. I and mean, he, I would love to put you in a room with Larry David and you drop that and just see his reaction. He'd go like this. He'd go like this. <laughs> I just saw a video of him at uh, at Fashion Week. Oh, really? The models walking by and he's like this. Too loud. He can't handle the music. Too loud. You know what it got, here's what it got me thinking, though. You know, I have interviewed Larry David and I interviewed him for one of the seasons of Curb Your Enthusiasm. And you could literally see the moment that he gets into character on the red carpet. Like he's actually a really nice guy. And then he's like, I, I remember I asked him something and then he became Larry David at that moment. Because of Super Troopers fame and now Tacoma FD fame, do people expect you guys to essentially be in character when they meet you? Or can you just be like normal Steve and normal Kevin? Yeah, I mean, that's why we shave the mustaches, you know, so that people don't, uh, they don't recognize us. It's our Clark Kent thing. Take the mustaches off and they don't ask us but you know people all the time they 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 want you to be farva or whatever you know i mean um and to be honest with you i am not anything like rod farva right he's a he's kind of an asshole and i'm a wonderful guy i'm i'm giving you a, a sideways look arthur i'm i'm looking at you at the corner <laughs> yeah uh it is funny people there are times where they just shout your character names they're, they're like farva farva Hey, Farva. Hey, Mac, Mac, Mac. And, and you're like, I actually do have a name. Like, I'm actually not that guy. You can call me. You should know my real name at this point. Do you feel like you have to deliver the goods in that moment? Like, I, I, it's funny because anytime I interview comedians, you get one of two things. The one is you can see the character, but then they're like the deepest introverts imaginable. And the last thing they want to do is talk to humanity. But then you have the people who actually match up to who they are on on screen and on stage. Do you feel like you have to be one or the other? I don't know. I, it's pretty easy to please them, though. Like if they throw out Farva, I throw back a line of dialogue from the movie, and then they, they cheer, and then you move on. You know what I mean? I think you know. It's never more than that, really. I don't know. I don't know, Kev. I don't know. Kev has it worse than I do, and I think it's more about the landfill character from Beer Fest. Like when we used to do our live shows, I mean, people always wanna come up and chug and they really wanna chug against Kevin. You know, they'll, they'll offer me to chug and I have no problem saying, no, I'm like, nah, I don't feel like it. Or I just did one, I don't feel like it. But Kevin indulges all of them and he crushes them. He kills them in the chug. And, but there are times where we're doing chugs and you can see there's a line 
there's a line of people like when we do our stand-up shows and we do the meet and greet he's just done like two in a row or three in a row and there's another person who comes up and he's like let's chug and he's like guy come on did you not just watch what i did and they don't care i don't i i don't they don't they're not as enthusiastic to chug with me and i also don't feel the need to to you know to placate them with uh with uh with bodily harm to myself as kevin does Kevin, doesn't that get old though? Does it ever get to a point where you're just like, leave me the fuck alone, I've chugged enough? Yeah, there, there are definitely those moments. And then you try to gather everyone together and like make an announcement. All right, I'm doing one right now. Get in on it or forget it. Don't ask me anymore. But you know, we learned something from uh, when we worked on Dukes of Hazard with, uh, with Johnny Knoxville. You know, he had a lot of people always like coming up and, they were, and he, he would be surrounded by people. And, uh, you know, I, I remember asking him, like, does it ever get old? And he said, my problems could be worse. Yeah. And it's true. <laughs> true. He was also surrounded 30 deep by hot chicks. And we were surrounded by college dudes offering us Jägermeister shots. It was different. <laughs> That's the difference. Yeah. It was different. You're like, damn, did we pick the wrong franchise? Why couldn't we just be paper cutting our penises for a living? <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Well, speaking of Knoxville, the fact that they're even doing Jackass 4, like there was, I just saw it, Knoxville was either on their cover of Variety or some magazine. He's got gray hair now. I've got yeah. Steve coming on the show next week. I'm so excited to have him on. And these guys are still doing this shit. Does it ever get to a point, especially for with physical comedy, where it becomes too much? Like, are you guys experiencing it where it's like, God damn, I've reached my limit here? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I mean... You know, we, the last time we saw Knoxville in person, I mean, he had all kinds of physical ailments and you're like, why do you do this to yourself, you know? And so for me, I had multiple kind of physical moments in the season of Tacoma and I just got a stuntman to do it for me, you know? I got a 25-year-old guy to come in, 25-year-old fat guy to come in and fall on shit. And uh, it was it, it was a pleasure. I didn't have to do that stuff anymore. Dude, I, I, the other day I was in bed and my kids like were rough housing and the comforter got pull down and I, I leaned forward to pull the comforter and I yanked my back. I was like, Oh, <laughs> I can't imagine like being fired out of a cannon and, and landing with my asshole on a bull's horn or something like that. You know, like it just, I feel like those guys are asking to, I don't know. It's worth it, buddy. <laughs> is there, is there a camaraderie between obviously your friends with Knoxville, but is there like a respect in the, the comedy circles of Hollywood when you've kind of had that, whether it's a super troopers or a jackass, like it's kind of like the nod when you see each other, like we did it with these characters in this franchise. It was cool. Like there's, we had a, a, a few years of good overlap where I think, was it beer fest that then the, like the jackass three trailer premiered in front of beer fest at our premiere. I, I can't remember, but it was like, we had, you know, with starting with Dukes of Hazard, we had a bunch of stuff where uh, we had a, movies coming out in, in tandem and our trailers would play in front of each other's movies and we were spending a lot of time with each other. That was pretty cool. Uh, that was kind of good. Fun. Like we've gotten to the point where we have a resume, we've been around for a while and you find out on this show, it kind of works that way where if you want someone to come on your show, you, you can just kind of call them up and they know who you are. They're like, hey, come work with us. And, you know, it's easier to get them to do that now because people know, you know, they know who you are, you know who they are, that kind of thing, you know? Oh my God, I want to know, who's the most famous person in both of your phones? Boy, famous oh. in my phone. <laughs> Look at me, I'm like, oh, oh, is it? Uh, oh, Steve Lemmy. Tom Cruise, wait, Brad Pitt or? I have Knoxville, I do have Knoxville on my phone. I guess he's probably the most famous guy on my phone. I mean, Knoxville's like a legit comedy A-lister at this point. <laughs> like, he's kind of a legend. We're going to we're going to look back at the Knoxville era and he's I feel like going to be kind of like remembered as like legit an icon like we're going to be oh, like yeah. wow I lived during the Johnny Knoxville era. That's why I love seeing him with the gray hair now like he, he just went totally silver fox and now he's in he's a you know he's like the professor emeritus you know. <laughs> <laughs> of, of, at clown school of, of slicing your 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 scrotum with the paper cut. I mean, I always wanted to ask him, how do you, I can't wait to ask Steve-O some of the shit that they've, that they've bagged. Like, we've seen the shit they came up with, but I can't wait to see the shit they couldn't pull off. <laughs> I mean, they put, like, I remember that the first Jackass, I remember laughing 
so hard. And I don't think I've ever laughed as hard at a movie. Like Dumb and Dumber, I laughed really hard at, but I don't think I, I, I've never laughed as hard as I did in Jackass 1. And it was just like, I mean, the car up the guy's ass, like. Yeah. And, and now my son is 12. And I've, you know, he, now we've watched the Jackass movies together and he had the same reaction. It's like reliving it. Like I've seen a 12 year old boy watch those movies. Like, wow, it's great. Parenting 101 over there, Steve. 12 year olds getting to watch Jackass. I Don't know. tell mom. Don't tell mom. Well, here's the thing. I, you know, I have a seven year old and, uh, and now my, my older son just turned 10 a couple of days ago. And they've been, they've grown up watching our stuff. You know, like they watched Tacoma FD. When, uh, when my older son was, was uh, seven, we had an episode where we were going out on calls where we keep getting dudes' uh, dicks unstuck from things that they've gotten them stuck in, which is a, a real firefighter thing. And, uh, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, all the time we, we get these guys. They've either got their dick stuck in something or there's something stuck up there, at, whatever it is. And it's the only episode my, my kids ever wanted to watch a second time. My, my seven-year-old was like, Dad, can we watch the episode where the guys get their penises stuck in things again? Like, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's ingrained in, in you know, our DNA. And uh, now it's ingrained in my kids. They're, they're watching the dumb stuff that we come up with. So before I let you guys go, one of the main reasons that I started the show was to talk to successful people about the habits and the mentality that help make them successful. So my question to you guys is, what are the habits you incorporate in your own life that help you continue to elevate? Um, for me, it's preparation. Like, uh, you know, I think it, a lot of times you get on camera, you do the comedy stuff and to other people it might seem kind of effortless or whatever, but there's a lot of work that goes into all this stuff and it's, it makes it easier when you're prepared. And uh, so, you know, we do a lot of preparation and uh, I think walking into a situation and being prepared for whatever might happen is just the best way to be successful. Uh, I agree with the preparation. I've really learned that from Kev. Kev, Kev is a great, uh, he's a great partner because he's, uh, he leads by example. And uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing. If you're, if you're going to, uh, you know, showing people the way is, is a good thing. If you're, if you're going to get into any endeavor, you should be the best at it of everybody there and, and uh, you know, really, really be thorough in, in, in what you do. For me, it's, you know, uh, it's to, uh, I think, uh, be open-minded, you know, uh, never fixate too much on the rules. Uh, also, I, I, I never stop you know, and uh, that, that goes in tandem with the next thing, but it's, I'm always looking down the road a little bit, particularly in our uh, line of work. You know, I focus on this thing, I, and then I dedicate some time to looking at what the future might hold for us. And also, I think the key is to take a little break from it uh, every day so you don't burn out on it. Guys, this was an absolute blast. Congratulations to ComFD is back, brand new season on True TV. You guys are always a blast to chat with. Thanks for making this a ton of fun. Thank you. Appreciate it, Arthur. See you guys. Bye. Take care, man. Good seeing you.